want to welcome everybody joining us here in person as well as those that are joining us online for part five of a series we've been in titled, So What? This series is all about how we can better manage, better steward the resources that God places in our hands. In fact, if you'll remember, one of the things we've said is that it would be a crazy expectation to expect God to send us more resources if we haven't first been found faithful with what it is he's already sent us. And so in this series, we've been helping you to become a better steward of what God has entrusted you with. Over the past four weeks, what I've done is I've given you four purposes for money in the life of the believer. And I say believer because if you are a non-believer, I want you to understand we are glad that you are here. Because at Expansion Church, you can belong before you believe. At Expansion Church, you can even belong before you behave. Some churches might tell you that you need to get your act together, then come to church. At Expansion Church, we say, no, come to church. We'll get you Jesus, and he'll clean you up. Come on, somebody. And so we're glad you're here if you're a non-believer. But this series is for believers. This series is for people who have made a commitment to follow Jesus. It's a series designed for people who have said, God, I want to honor you in every way in my life, to include financially. And so I gave you four reasons, uh, four purposes for uh, money in the life of the believer. The first purpose is to, number one, to sustain life. Come on, y'all. I I, I need money to pay bills. Yeah, like I got to keep the lights on. I got to keep the water on. I got to have wheels. If I, can't, if I don't have wheels, I can't move around. I can't get to work to, pro- to provide my family with an income. I got to be able to sustain myself. So the first purpose of money is to sustain life. The second purpose of money is to create margin. Come on, somebody. There's this thing called Murphy's Law, and Murphy's Law simply says anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Yes, maybe you've been feeling like that on a regular. Yeah, Pastor, I can relate to that one. Come on. If we don't have money for those things that go wrong, then we put ourselves in a position where we unnecessarily stress, where we have unnecessary anxiety. And so I've talked to you about why it's important for us to have margin in our life so that when emergencies happen, when the car breaks down, when I have the doctor's bill that I was not planning on, I've got money to take care of. Are you with me? So number two, we have money so that we can create margin. The third reason why we have money is so that we can Uh, advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. I told you that uh, salvation is free, but everything else costs. Come on, somebody. Yeah. God's plan from the very beginning was to use you and I to help build the kingdom of God right here on earth. In fact, if you'll remember, I asked you to put your your finger in the air, if you will. Do me a favor. Take your index finger. Put it high in the sky. Wave it like it just don't care. Come on, somebody. Take that finger. Now put it on your chest. What's God's plan for kingdom advancement? You and me. Like, that's the plan. Yeah, you are the plan. Yes, he wants to use you financially as well. Amen? Here's the last one. We said that the fourth reason or the first, fourth purpose of money is so that we can leave a legacy. Come on. I'm not just living for me. I'm trying to put myself in a position where that I, I can leave a legacy to my kids and to my grandkids. In fact, I told you uh, that the Bible says that a good man leaves an inheritance to his kids, kids. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to leave an inheritance behind. And so there are four purposes for money. I told you over the last couple of weeks, you know, Friday night happens. You know, I just got paid. I'm feeling good on Friday night because now God has blessed me with a bunch of seed. I log into Bank of America to PNC Bank. I log into, come on, give me some banks, TD Bank. Chase Bank, you know what I'm saying? I log in and, and, and uh, the Lord has blessed me with seed. Come on, somebody. How I sow that seed matters. I told you that the first bucket we're going to sow into is which bucket? Kingdom. Yeah, we're going to sow into the kingdom, the first 10%. Why? Because we believe that when we give God the first 10%, he blesses the other 90? Yeah. So we're going to give to God first. After we uh, pour into the kingdom bucket, we're then going to pour into these next two buckets, margin, and leaving a legacy. Why? We're going to split 10% between those buckets because I got to pay me. If I don't pay myself, when things happen, I have nothing to fall back on. And so I'm going to pour into the next two buckets, and then I'm going to take the last 80% of what I have, 
and I'm going to pour it into the sustain bucket. Come on, somebody. I got to pay them daycare bills. If I don't pay them daycare, they're going to kick my babies out. Yeah, yeah. So the next 80% I'm going to spend on sustaining life. The problem I told you with most believers is that they go straight to this bucket. They skip the first three, and they go straight to this bucket. And because you go straight to this bucket, you end up in a position where now you haven't saved for a rainy day. So when the rainy day happens, what do you do? You end up taking away from this bucket right here. Now I'm struggling because now I, I've taken away from my fp bill. Now fp is sending me late, uh, late, late bills. But, which, by the way, some of us, you paying so many late fees. If you added up all the late fees you pay, goodness gracious, that, that's your margin money right there. It's all going to late fees. What have I tried to do? Over the past four weeks, I've tried to give you a system that you can use to better steward your money. So I hope it's been a blessing to you. Every once in a while, we like to give you the opportunity to ask questions. And so last week, if you'll remember, we put a QR code on the screens, and I asked you to take out your phone, scan the QR code, and then uh, we wanted you to submit your questions. And I told you I was going to do my best today to answer as many financial-based questions as I possibly can. Now, we do this for a reason. Uh, we purposely don't put a microphone out there and uh, hand a microphone around because I don't know what you're going to say. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so we purposely do it this way so we can screen what comes in. Come on, somebody. And so my wife is going to be my Banner White today. She's going to be my assistant. She's going to read the question for me, and then we're going to go in. Sounds good? Everybody ready? Question number one, baby, come on. Question number one, what is the church's role in helping to stabilize the finances of its members? Hmm. Now, I need to tell y'all something. I read this question about 20 times. Now, there is what I hope the person is trying to say, and there is what I think the person is actually trying to say. So I'm going to answer both. I'm going to answer what I hope they're trying to say, and then I'm going to answer what I think they're actually trying to say. What I hope that they're trying to say is, hey, pastor, what does the church do to help those that fall short in the church bridge the gap? Mm -hmm. So if I got somebody in the church and they can't pay their light bill, what does the church do to help them? That, 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 that's what I hope they're asking, okay? Every church has to be good at two things, outreach and inreach. If we're only good at outreach, then we'll reach people from the outside, but then those that come here won't feel like they're ever cared for, and then they'll leave. And so we have, as a church, we've got to balance both. And so we've been phenomenal at outreach, and what you might not know is we're also really good at inreach. There are people in our church that will tell you when they hit hard times, uh, they were part of the team, and they came to us and said, hey, like, I got a little gap. Is there any way the church can help with the gap? Now, we have a policy in place. Come on, somebody. We can't just give money all the time. We're not going to pay your Amazon Prime bill. Yes, you know what I'm saying? No, we're not, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Uh, uh, we're not going to pay your vacation. No, we're not going to do that. Right. But, but, but there are some essentials that people have if you're in a position where uh, you, you're facing a situation where you're, you're, you're not going to have a roof over your head. As a church, we, we want to come alongside you and help in a situation like that. And yeah. We have a policy in place. We, we have how much we'll give per year, all, all that good stuff. But as a church, I need you to understand, yes, we come alongside and we help those that are in need. Come on, that's what, that's what we're here for. Come yeah, on, somebody. Yeah. But here's what I think the person was actually saying. <laughs> what I think the person was actually saying is that the church has a responsibility to you to get your money right. Mm -hmm. And here's what I, I like, I'm, all right, I'm going to give you, I'm gonna give you the, the, long, the long of it, okay? I could give you the short, I'm going to give you the long of it, okay? So in the, old, in the New Testament, particularly the book of Acts, you see the origin of the Christian church. In the very beginning of the church, believers were interdependent on one another, and they were dependent on God, mm -hmm. right? Interdependence is necessary. You can't be a church if there's no degree of interdependence. That's necessary. You got to have a certain degree of interdependence. But I've also heard this saying before that says, if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for one day. If you teach a man to fish, he'll eat for the rest of his life. What is our responsibility when it, as a church when it comes to your finances? Our responsibility is to teach you how to fish so that you can win at life. 
Yeah. yeah. No, our goal is not to give handouts. No, no, no. Our goal is to teach you how to fish so that you don't feel like you have to be dependent on the church, so that you don't feel like you have to be dependent on the government, so that you don't feel like you have to be dependent on anybody else. How have we done that? Well, we gave you a four-week teaching on how to put a system in place with your money. Yeah. What else did we do? On Tuesdays, for the, all throughout the month of August, we've done something called Money Talks. Some of you all have showed up, about 15 of you all have showed up consistently, praise the Lord. But we got 300 people on the weekends. Some of us haven't even taken that step. So here's the question I have for the person who put the question, is, question in. What are you doing to stabilize your finances? Come on. Like, that's the real question. Because it's easy to point at everybody else. How are you helping me? What are you doing for me? No, what are you doing for you? That question makes me mad. Go on to question number two. Come on, somebody. Go on to question number two. Question question number number one, we love you. Okay, question number two. My husband and I started dating after we were already full-grown adults with our own homes and accounts already in place. When we got married, we just agreed who would be responsible for paying what. Sometimes I go back and forth as to whether or not we should just put everything in one pot. So the short answer is yes. <laughs> you should put all your money, if you are married, you should put all your money together in one pot. Here's why. There's this thing called a Belgian horse. Belgian horses compete all around the globe. A Belgian horse can pull 8,000 pounds by itself. But if you take that same horse and you harness it to another Belgian horse, now, instead of pulling double, so from 8,000, what would the next be? 16,000. Come on, y'all got A's in math. Look at y'all. Y'all are smart. Instead of being able to pull 16,000, two Belgian horses can pull 24,000 pounds. Look at this passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 19, verse 5. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Pastor How in the world does this relate to my marriage? Here's how. Here's how. You and your spouse were designed to pull together. And when both of y'all are pulling together as one, you're going to accomplish things that couples that are pulling together as two could never accomplish. Like, yes, if I got my money over here and my wife has her money over here, while yes, it might bring me a little bit of peace and comfort because I got my money, don't touch my stuff, But at the end of the day, we're not working together on the same goals. We don't have the same vision for where we're going. So, yes, while it might have been working for you, I promise you, if you all can get together on this thing, Mm -hmm. it's going to bring unity. It's going to take your finances to another level. And it's going to make your marriage just that much better. Some of us, the issues that we have in our marriage have a a lot to do with the fact that we just don't have unity because we're doing everything apart. You didn't marry your spouse to be a part? Okay, let me ask you this. I got a question for you, whoever put this question in. Because these are anonymous. I don't know who put this question in. Here's the question I have for you. You share everything else with your spouse. You have no problem sharing a bed with your spouse. But then when it's time to share money, now it's like, no, no, no. (laughs) Keep your hands off my money. (laughs) What that says to me is that you have an unhealthy relationship with money. You need to spend some time with the Lord praying that God would help to release the grip that you have on money. It's just money. Come on. It's just, okay, we got a guy on our board who's a business owner. And there are times where I'm like stressing over money. Well, okay, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? And then he'll stop me and he'll say, Pastor, it's just money. I think we put too much value on on this thing called money. Come on, somebody. It's just money. It's just money. Okay, babe, give me this next one. Question three. What should you do if a spouse does not trust sharing financial information with the other? For example, in the past, spouse one had access to an account with extra money, which belonged to spouse two. Spouse one got upset and cleared the account out. (laughs) And some of y'all are like, and that's why I don't share money with them right there. That's it right there. That's it right there. I never had that problem because I keep my money over there. Hey, listen, 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 listen. It sounds to me like this person doesn't have a money issue. They have a trust issue. It's not a money problem. It's a trust problem. 
And here's the reality. Everything we talked about over the past several weeks, if you don't have trust in place in your household, you'll never be able to pull this off. See, trust is at the foundation of the relationship. It's kind of like if I got a house, I'm not going to build the walls and put a roof on it if I got a faulty foundation. Mm -hmm. What do I have to do? I got to focus on building the foundation. Then I can build everything else on top of a healthy foundation. If you have trust issues in your marriage, you don't have a healthy foundation. I would say you probably need to go and get some counseling. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, you need somebody that's going to help you deal with the trust issues that you have. Okay, let me speak to spouse number one real quick. The person who went and cleared out their account, <laughs> went to the mall. Come on, somebody. <laughs> what that tells me is that you probably don't understand how marriage works. Because even if you were to go get a divorce in the state of Florida, and you stand before a judge, even if your name is not on the account, it's still your money. So when you think you're hurting your spouse by going and blowing that money, you're actually hurting you too. So you think you blew the money, what you did was you blew the trust. You need to go get some counseling so that y'all can regain that trust. It's going to require, in order for you to pull this off, Y'all got to be able to trust each other. Yes, sir. Amen? Amen. Amen. Question four. In a marriage, how can we ensure that financial decisions are fair despite income differences? Husband is the breadwinner, wife is a stay-at-home mom, or wife makes six figures and husband makes 50000 Oh, okay. <laughs> Remember we said we're two becoming one, yeah. Right? So if we're two becoming one, then it doesn't matter whether this year my wife made a million and I made thirty thousand. We just made one million thirty thousand dollars this year. Thank you, honey. You did good this year. Mate. You did good. You did good. You did good. Okay, okay. Look at, look at, look at, look at. Uh, if, uh, last or this was the first uh, week that I shared this. We started. So what? Uh, I share with you my budget. In fact, if you guys could put that. Back on the screen for me, please. Uh, Those of y'all that weren't here, I told you I zeroed out some of the most important numbers on here because I don't need you in my business. Come on. (laughs) So this is is our budget. We have this times two because we get paid twice a month, so we have this times two. This is one of them. Uh, When we get paid, it doesn't matter what's on this line right here. It doesn't matter what's on this line right here. If this one's bigger than that one or that one's bigger than that one, who cares? The only thing that matters is what it adds up to at the top. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. As long as what this adds up to at the top is more than this, we're doing all right. (laughs) If your ego Mm. is big because you make more money than your spouse, so you don't allow them to be a part of the decision making, Mm. then I would say you've got some things you need to work on. You got some stuff you need to work on. Well, Pastor, doesn't the Bible say? That as the man, I should be the leader of my house. Absolutely. However, leader doesn't mean you don't listen to your spouse. Come on. Man. Yeah. Like, the best leaders allow for input from the people that follow them. Mm-hmm. If you don't, you won't be leading for long. Right. Yeah. Come on, somebody. Yes, don't get hung up on who makes more money. Women are doing the doggone thing now, y'all. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Women are doing the doggone thing. <laughs> yeah. In, in fact, in fact, uh, in fact, uh, when, when you look at going to college, black women are going to college at higher rates than black men. Black women are doing it. Women in general are doing the doggone thing. Men, we got to work on our ego. Yeah, yeah you're going to have some situations where your wife is making that million dollars and you making 30000 It's okay. <laughs> there was, a, there was a, a couple that I counseled one time. The husband was a bus driver, and he used his bus driver income to send his wife to medical school. She finished medical school, and then she gets out of medical school, and now she's making a lot of money. But the the reason why they they came to me for counseling was because now the wife was like, I'm making all this money. He was supposed to go back to school. He don't want to go back to school. I'm making all the money. I should make all the decisions. And the thing that I shared with them was, first of all, I was like, that man put your behind through medical school. (laughs) That's it. I worked them through. I worked them through the same thing. It doesn't matter 
if she's making more money or he's making more money, mm -hmm. your focus is all wrong. Don't allow the enemy, what he wants to do, is he wants to use the difference in income to create disunity yes, in sir. your marriage. Yes, yeah. sir. Don't allow him to do it. Right. Amen? Amen. 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 Question Next number, question. Question number five. How can we handle financial requests from family members and or friends? Don't give them nothing. That's what you do. I'm joking. I'm joking. That's a joke. That's a joke. That's a joke. That's a joke. Yeah. No. I believe you should help your family when you're able. I believe you should not only help your family. I believe you should help coworkers when you're able. I believe you should help uh, your neighbors when you're able. The problem is because so many of us have never prioritized this bucket right here, oftentimes we're never able. So what we end up doing is when mama calls, mama's getting up there in age, now mama needs something, what we end up doing is we go in this bucket right here, the sustained bucket. And so once we start taking out of this bucket right here, mm -hmm. now we can't pay the water bill. Mm -hmm. Mama good, but we can't pay the light bill. Right. Mama's good, but now we're behind on our car payment. Mm -hmm. And then it ends up creating stress and anxiety in your marriage. Correct. You're wondering why you can't get together on one accord. Your, your wife, your husband is not mad at your mama. They're mad at you because y'all haven't planned. If you got margin, my wife mm -hmm. will sometimes come to me and she'll say, baby, uh, the Holy Spirit, <laughs> the Holy Spirit said we should give this person $1,000. And I'm like, that ain't the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's the devil. That's the devil, right? If we didn't have margin, mm -hmm. we'd be in a position where we wouldn't be able to help anybody else. Yeah. I would challenge you. Yes, you should be generous, generous, but I would challenge you to in this next season, maybe you need to tell mama, aunties, uncles, maybe you got family overseas that's counting on you. I would tell them in this next season, I'm going to work this system and I'm going to get my money right. Mm -hmm. So you got to wait six months. You got to wait a year. I'm going to get my money right. And then once I have margin, I'm going to give to you from the margin. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to give to you from this right here. Are you with me on that? Yeah. This is going to create conflict in your house. This, when my wife comes to me talking about the Holy Spirit and I told her, this don't create much conflict. Right. Because at the end of the day, I know we're going to be all right. Yeah. Because we don't put our money in the right buckets. Are you with me on that? Yeah. Okay. Question six. I think, that's, I think that's my answer. I think. Okay. That's Question. the whole answer. You ready for me, babe? Go for it. Okay. <laughs> okay, hold on. I got one. No, go ahead. Let's just sit. I have a vision for opening a business. It's always in the back of my mind. My current job that helps sustain us provides me with no work-life balance. On my off time, I no longer have the energy for anything else. How do I go about building my own dream while funding it at the same time? Come on. Lead, lead the question up, guys, for me in the back room. Um, so it has become increasingly difficult to survive in this society, especially as inflation has gone higher and higher and higher. In fact, if you are a family of four, right now, if you're making less than $125,000 a year combined, it is becoming more and more difficult to survive, which is why you might need a little side hustle. Like, you should have a steady eddy, and you might need another stream of income. Multiple streams of income are sometimes a good thing. Come on, somebody. I remember when, I, uh, when my kids uh, were little, we were paying daycare bills. I think at one point in time, uh, we were paying $1,500 a month in daycare bills. Come on, somebody. Yeah. That stuff is expensive. Should be against the law to charge people that much money, right? We're paying like $1,500 a month. And, and so I had to find another stream of income. And so here I was. I was a school teacher, uh, and I started selling real estate. And there would be some years where I could make as much selling real estate as I was making at my steady eddy. Yeah, you might need to find yourself a little side hustle so that you can help make ends meet. Now this person says that they are tired when they get off. Listen to me, we all tired when we get off. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. And here's the thing, it might only be temporary. It's just a season, right? Like you might have to, you might have to sweat a little bit in this season. You got to do what you got to do. You got to feed your family. Come on, somebody. Yeah. If this was a man, you behind need to go work. 
like, like this, like this, this, like New Age society is like, you know, how does it feel? How does it feel? How does it feel? Your behind need to work. Yeah, Come on, somebody. Here's the next. That was that wasn't even my notes. That wasn't even my notes. Here's the next thing that I wanted to say. Now, sometimes, sometimes, when you're trying to work a side hustle, sometimes it just don't work. Maybe there's like something that God has called you to do and. Doing that thing on the side just is not going to work because you can't really be excellent at multiple things, right? right? Like something's going to suffer, mm -hmm. right? Um, so some cases, you need to take the leap of faith and jump into whatever it is the Lord is calling you to go into. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's business ownership. I asked you all last week, I told you all last week that we're doing an entrepreneurship 101 class in, uh, on September the 21st. I'd love for you all, how many of y'all have a dream to start a business? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to be here on September the 21st. Maybe God is calling you to step into that thing. And in some cases, you need to take the dive. But it's how you take the dive that matters. Yeah. Yeah. Don't go to your job on Tuesday talking about pastor told me to quit. <laughs> Listen, in order for you to take the dive, you need to first prepare to take the dive. That's one of the issues a lot of business owners struggle with is they don't prepare. How do I know if I'm prepared? How much money do I have in these two buckets? The more money I have in these buckets, the more I'm prepared. Do I have three to six months yeah. of income? No matter what happens, I'm going to be all right because I got money in these buckets. But if these buckets look like this for you, if these two buckets are empty, you ain't got nothing right. to go and start a business. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You need to prepare. So maybe God is calling you to take the leap six months from now, a year from now, two years from now. But you need to prepare. One of the number one reasons why businesses fail is a lack of funding. You just don't have enough money to make it until the business begins to thrive. Yeah. Are you with me on that? So you need to prepare. Two different options. Some people, you just need to pick up some other multiple streams, some other streams of income. Others, you need to make the leap. You need to prepare and then make the, the dive into that next thing that's going to pay you more in the long term. Sounds good? Question seven. So when you say save for legacy, what does that look like? Education account, savings account, trust, stocks, or a mixture of all three? Yeah, all three. Okay, so uh, when I say legacy... I mean anything that you have a value that will outlive you. So if you have educational accounts, they can outlive you. If you've got savings accounts, those can outlive you. If you've got uh, 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 stocks, those can outlive you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, here, here's the thing, here's the thing. You might need to go get a financial advisor that's going to help you because each one of those count, accounts, they work different. They're taxed differently, they grow differently, this is the worst thing you could do. The worst thing you could do is go on Google and get financial advice. That's the quickest way to end up broke. Then you're going to start blaming the system. Hey, this stuff don't work. No, it works. You just didn't know how to work it because you read it on Google. Come on, somebody. You need to get a financial advisor that's going to help you work through this thing so that he can set you up. My, my dad, I told y'all last week, my dad died last year. And when my dad died, uh, he really hadn't planned for how he would transfer assets to me and my brother. And so we ended up in a situation where we had to pay $5,000 to an attorney, which is another reason why you need some margin. I know I keep coming back to this, but I'm coming back to it for a reason. It's why you need some margin. If I didn't have the money to pay the attorney, you think she's gonna work for me for free? Absolutely not. That woman drew up three pieces of paper and I paid her $5,000 for three pieces of paper. Come on, somebody. So she went before the judge, and the judge had to legally move everything from my dad to myself and to my brother. But there's a better way. So there's this thing called a trust account. The person just mentioned it. A trust is how wealthy people, or even unwealthy people, it doesn't even matter, move money from one generation to the next generation. Let me tell you something. Trust accounts are dope, okay? They're better than having a will in place. And all you have to do is go to your financial advisor, they'll connect you with an attorney, and then you can put everything you own in the trust, and then you tell the trust how to give the stuff to your kids. Maybe your kids are irresponsible. Well, the great thing is, with a trust, you can set benchmarks that they have to meet, 
in order for them to get access to your cash. It's an incredible thing. But oftentimes, a lot of people just don't know about it. So then they end up dying, and then now their family members are stuck. They don't know how to get the assets from the family member to themselves. Get yourself a trust account. Put everything in it. Everything. All right, give me another one. Next question. Does tithing also apply to your time and talents? Some people believe this applies also to dedicating time and gifts towards serving others and kingdom building. While I found... While I while I've encountered some who feel because I give money, I don't have to do anything else. So here's the thing. Serving and giving are two different distinct things. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, it says, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I tell you in signing day, we're never more like Christ than when we serve and give. Mm -hmm. What happens, though, is there are some people who don't like to give. Mm -hmm. And people who don't like to give will come up with any excuse yeah. not to give. Yeah. So here's how it goes. They'll say, well, serving and giving are kind of the same thing, aren't they? No. In fact, in Scripture, they're treated as two completely different things. Why? God does something different in and through you with both of them. Let me give you an example. When you serve, God gives you a spiritual gift. In fact, the moment we give our hearts to Jesus, we are all given, according to 1 Corinthians, we're all given a spiritual gift. We use that spiritual gift to edify the body or build the body, uh, build the kingdom of God. That's different than when you give. When you give, does it help edify the body? Absolutely. However, the biggest thing that it does when you give is it gives you a generous heart. Yeah. What good is it if you're always pouring out, helping to build the kingdom, but you're stingy on the inside? Mm -hmm. But you got heart problems. Mm -hmm. God's trying to do both of those. So if I had a person who served, but they don't like to give, as a pastor, my job is to help challenge them to begin giving. Mm -hmm. If there's a person who gives, but they don't like to serve, my job is to challenge. There was a brother that was coming to our church. This brother was loaded. I'm talking, that brother had money upon money upon money. But he hated serving. He was like, I don't have time for that. I'm busy. I got my businesses. I'm, I'm busy. And we got him to a place where we helped him to understand that if he's not doing both, there's no way he can actually mature in Christ. So he got to a point where he's actually holding the door for people on Sunday mornings. And I thought it was the most incredible thing ever in fact, he came to me afterwards and he was like, man, pastor, thank you for pushing me into this because God is using me to help build the kingdom. Now it's not just my money that's at work. Now God's changing my heart. Are you with me on that? God is challenging us to do both. Here's the last thing I would say to this person. Stop looking at what everybody else is and isn't doing. And start asking, what is God trying to do in and through me? Stop worrying about, oh, well, somebody over here, they're not, I serve all the time. They don't ever serve. They just give. But I serve and I, I don't give. Stop worrying about what everybody else is doing and start focusing on what God is trying to do in and through you when it comes to serving and giving. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Last question. In week one, you talked about creating a budget, intentional spending plan. How do I budget if I get paid commission or have a variable income? Can you guys do me a favor and put the budget back up there uh, from a little bit earlier? There we go. Okay. If you do not make money, uh, or you make money but it's not on a regular basis, you make commission. I work at the, uh, the store where we sell furniture or, 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 or I sell products to people, and, and my money is all over the place. Here's what I would challenge you to do. I would challenge you to budget based upon the lowest dollar amount you bring in. So let's just pretend I make on a good month $8,000 a month. And on a bad month, I make $4,000 a month. I'm not going to budget based upon $8,000. Why? Because if that money don't come in, now I'm going to be a wreck. I'm not, listen, I'm not going to buy a house or buy cars based upon the $8,000. I'm going to budget everything based upon the $4,000. So here, I'm going to put here, rocks check, $4,000, not $8,000. Once the money comes in, 
I can always go over here and change things later on. Maybe I'm going to put a little more in savings. Maybe I'm going to give a little more to the kingdom. I can always change things, but I'm not going to budget based upon the high dollar amount. I'm always going to budget based upon the low dollar amount. Are you with me on that? Here's the good thing, or the, uh, or the thing that I would challenge you all to do, just budget. What a lot of people do, they don't ever plan for their money. And because you don't have a plan for the money, you don't know where the money is going. So you end up getting paid on Friday, and by Monday, you broke again. <laughs> if you put a plan in place, it changes the likelihood of that ever happening. Are you with me on that? Well, I ended with four minutes and 40 seconds left. Come on, somebody. Did anybody get anything good out of that? So we're closing out this series today. And I just want you to know how excited I am as your pastor. Because I'm believing that what we've talked about over the past five weeks, I'm believing you're going to put this stuff in place in your life. Just shake your head, yes. I'm believing, just shake your head, yes, yes, yes. I'm believing you're going to put this stuff in place in your life. I'm believing that by you putting a system in place, you're going to be in a position where you're going to be able to bless other people. I'm believing that by you putting this stuff in place, you're going to be in a place where your kids and your grandkids aren't going to have to worry. I'm believing that you're going to be in a place where you're going to be able to invest in the kingdom, recognizing that the Great Commission is not just about what we say we believe. The Great Commission is also about our actions and how we live our lives. Going back to that first question where the person asked about what's the responsibility of the church. Our responsibility is to equip you, to give you all the tools you need to succeed. I've tried over the past four weeks to pour out everything I know about finance. Now, I'm not an expert, but I'm pretty far ahead in this. Here's what I can't help, though. You ever heard that saying before, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink? I can't force you to do it. Week from now, a month from now, a year from now, we're not going to be talking about this every week. It's all going to be up to you. Are you going to continue to work the system? Or are you going to do what most people in our society do? And they sit back and they point fingers and look at them. Look what they're doing. It's all on you. Take this.